I'm really much excited to introduce the next speaker. Nair Ayal is amazing. As many of you know, some of the best tactics and strategies for entrepreneurship comes from experienced entrepreneurs who've been through the grind and the hustle just like you. Nair Ayal is no foreigner to this experience. He has built and scaled companies, one that has been venture backed, one that has been acquired, and has since transitioned to helping other entrepreneurs, like all of you in the room, succeed with his top selling book called Hooked, How to Build and Scale Productive products that make people love you. So please join me in a resounding welcome. Get up on your feet and introduce Nir Ayal. Thank you. Thanks very much. Louder. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks very much. Hey, everybody. Thank you so much. Uh, it's, it's a pleasure to be here. And I just want you to know, by the way, that uh, there is an army of people back here uh, that is making this conference happen. They're all over the place. So can we just take a, a, a quick minute to thank those folks that have put in so much work to making this conference? Thank you very much. So um, today I want to talk about for just a few minutes about how to make your product habit forming. You know, when we think about the technologies that we're carrying around with us every day, these, these amazing devices in our pockets, these products have had a profound impact on our day-to-day -day lives. And so what I want to answer today is this question around how do they do it? How do companies like Facebook and Twitter and Instagram and WhatsApp and Slack and Snapchat, how do they bring people back time and time again? Not just in the consumer space, but also in the enterprise space, these products that form consumer habits. So I have just a few minutes with you this morning, but what we're gonna do right after my talk, actually, at 10 o'clock, there's going to be a Q&A session where, we, where we, I would love to take your questions. Uh, come ready, uh, that, that's my favorite part, is, is kind of this open-ended questions and answers to try and figure out uh, any kind of engagement challenges you have. Because a lot of people today voc focus on growth and growth hacking, and that's super important, but remember, that's only a piece of the puzzle that if you can't retain users, if you can't keep them coming back, you've got nothing. So I would argue that engagement is, is as important, if not more important, than growth. So what we want to try and do today is to try and understand what is it about these companies that keeps people coming back. And through my research, I would argue that all of these world-changing companies who are touching the lives of hundreds of millions, if not billions of users, and making hundreds of millions, if not billions of dollars, all have embedded within their products what I call a hook. Now, a hook is a four-step process. It's, it's, it's built into the user experience. I describe a lot more of it in my book. But what I want to do today is to kind of walk you through the four steps of a hook to kind of give you a 30,000 foot view of this basic pattern that we see repeated again and again and again in all sorts of products that keep us coming back on our own. Hooks have these four basic parts. Every hook starts with a trigger. Triggers are these things that tell us what to do next. Now there are two types of triggers. We have external triggers, and we have internal triggers. External triggers are things in our environment that tell us what to do next with some piece of information in the trigger itself. Click here, buy now, play this. These are things in our environment right, that we see that tell us what to do. They give us the information for what to do next. Right? We as product designers, we know all about these external triggers. We see them every single day. But what product people don't think about enough and what turns out to be absolutely critical to forming these long-term habits is creating an association with what's called an internal trigger. Internal triggers are things that tell the user what to do next, but the information for what to do is stored as a memory inside the user's head. Now, these internal triggers are most frequently emotions, but not just any emotion. They are specifically negative emotions. Negative emotions are these most often occurring internal triggers. So what we do when we're feeling bored or lonesome or uh, dissatisfied or fatigued or uncertain, what we do when we experience these negative emotions prompts us to action, prompts us to turn to these apps, to these devices with little or no conscious thought.
In fact, there was a, a study a few years ago that found that people suffering from depression, from clinical depression, check email more often. I actually just saw like three people put away their phones. I'm not sure. Anyway, what this study found was that people suffering from depression experience what psychologists call negative valence states. They feel down more often than the rest of the population. And what are they doing to boost their mood to get out of those negative valence states? They were turning to their devices. They were going online. They were checking email more often than the rest of the population. And if we're honest with ourselves, we all do this, right? We all do this. Let me tell you folks, there is only one reason that people use your product. There's only one reason that people use any product. And that one reason is to modulate our mood, to make us feel something different. Let me ask you, what, um, what website or app do we go to when we're feeling the emotion of loneliness? Where do we go? Facebook, right? Somebody said Tinder. Also, <laughs> also true, different kind of loneliness, but also true. <laughs> what, what about uh, when we're feeling uncertain? Before we scan our brains to see if we know the answer, what are we doing? We Google it, of course. And what about when we're bored? You know, between 2 and 4 o'clock in the afternoon, you have that big project you don't feel like working on right now. Where do you go? You check YouTube. You check Reddit. You check stock prices. You see what's happening in the news, right? All of these products cater to this painful internal trigger of boredom. We don't like that sensation, and we turn to these products and services with little or no conscious thought. Before we even understand why we're using these products, we're already online. So what does that mean for you? How can we help people improve their lives? How can we help them live richer lives by knowing about the importance of these internal triggers? If you want to build a healthy habit in your customer's life, you have got to be able to tell me what is your internal trigger. It's amazing. When I, I work in my consulting practice and I'm I talk to folks, uh, product teams, they bring me in for these big expensive design reviews and they tell me all the amazing technological features of their product. And when I ask the team, okay, that's terrific, but what's the internal trigger? What's the frequently occurring itch that your product is addressing? They haven't a clue. So you've got to be able to tell me what that internal trigger is and does it occur with sufficient frequency to form a habit. L let me talk about this word frequency. It's incredibly important when it comes to these habit-forming products. The data shows us that if your behavior, if the habit that you want to create in your user's day-to-day -day life, if that does not occur within a week's time or less, you have a problem. It is almost impossible to change consumers' habits if the behavior does not occur within a week's time or less. Now, more is always better. When you think about products like Facebook and Slack and Instagram and WhatsApp and Snapchat, how often are these products used? How often? Right? More, more than daily. These are intra-daily behaviors. The stats are showing us that people check their home screens 150 times a day. So these products have a very, very high habit-forming potential because they're used so frequently. So the minimum bar has to be for your habit to take hold that that key behavior, opening the app, scrolling a feed, checking something, that has to occur within a week's time or less. Okay? And you have to be able to tell me what is that internal trigger that prompts them to action, that itch, that emotional, that, that negative valence state that prompts them to action. Okay? The second step of the hook is the action phase. The action phase is defined as the simplest behavior done in anticipation of a reward. The simplest thing the user can do to scratch that itch, to get relief. It's a, something as simple as scrolling on Pinterest, or a quick search on Google, or what could be simpler than just pushing the play button on YouTube. These incredibly simple actions done in anticipation of an immediate reward. Now, there's a great formula that I, that I like to share with folks that comes from a researcher at Stanford by the name of BJ Fogg, and Fogg tells us that for any singular behavior, any singular behavior, we just need three things at the same time. For any behavior to occur, any click, any action, anything you want the user to do, they have to have sufficient motivation. Motivation is the energy for action, how much we want to do a particular behavior. They have to have sufficient ability. Ability is the capacity to do the behavior, how easy it is to do. 
and the trigger must be present, right? We just talked all about triggers. Now, we know the trigger has to be there. That's a precondition. Let's talk about motivation and ability. Nine times out of 10, when I work with product teams, they're trying to figure out how to motivate people to do the behavior, right? Let's show them a video. Let's give them testimonials. Let's talk at them. Let's prove to them why they should be more motivated to do the thing we want them to do. 90% of the time, that's the wrong approach. The better approach, the better ROI for your time, money, and, and brain, uh, brain cycles is to worry about ability. That it turns out that the harder something is to do, the less likely people are to do it. So there are six factors of ability, six factors of ability, six things that you can do to make the behavior you want done more likely to occur. You can decrease how much time something takes, how much money something costs, how much physical effort is required. Brain cycles, brain cycles are very important when it comes to technology products because the harder something is to understand, the less likely that behavior is to occur. Social deviance is number five. Social deviance has to do with the fact that people are less likely, I'm sorry, are more likely to do something when they see other people like them doing it. And finally, non-routine is number six. Non-routine says that we become more likely to do something simply for the fact that we have done it before in the past. And this is why habits are so important. Because the more we do a particular behavior, the easier it becomes and the more likely we are to do it in the future. What do we call that? That's called practice. The more we do it, the easier it becomes, the more likely we are to do it in the future. So habits have this repeater effect. The more we do something, the easier it becomes and we become more likely to do it. Now, we've talked about internal triggers. We've talked about external triggers. We've talked about making the action as easy as possible to do. Now it comes the time to give users what they came for, to give them the reward, to scratch their itch. And that's the third step of the hook, the reward phase. I argue that it's not good enough to just give people what they want. It's not good enough just to give people what they want. What all of the products, all the companies that I mentioned earlier all do, they give people what they want, they scratch the itch, but they leave them wanting more. And here's how they do it. They all use a variable reward. A variable reward comes from the work of B.F. Skinner. B.F. Skinner was a father of operant conditioning. If you took Psych 101 back in college, you'll know the name. Skinner took, did these very famous experiments where he took pigeons and he put them in a little box and he gave them a disc to peck at. And at first, every time the pigeon would peck at the disc, they would receive a reward. They would get a little food pellet. They were all hungry pigeons, by the way. They had to have the internal trigger of hunger to begin with for this experiment to work. So basically, peck at the disc, get a food pellet. Terrific. That's called operant conditioning. He could train these pigeons to know to peck at the disc whenever they wanted the food pellet. But then Skinner did something a little bit different. Skinner introduced a variable reward. So sometimes the pigeon would peck at the disc and no food pellet, no reward would come out. The next time the pigeon would peck at the disc, they would receive a reward. And what Skinner observed was that the rate of response, the number of times these pigeons pecked at the disc, increased when the reward was given on a variable schedule of reinforcement. Why does this happen? Because variability spikes this reward system in our brain. It creates this wanting, this desirous response. And so in all sorts of products that you find most engaging, uh, most habit-forming, the things that capture your attention and won't let go, by the way, both offline and online, you will find these variable rewards. There are three types of variable rewards. Let me describe these for you briefly. Three types of variable rewards. Rewards of the tribe, rewards of the hunt, and rewards of the self. And when you start looking for these, you will see them in everything that holds on to your attention. Rewards of the tribe are things that feel good, that have this element of variability, this bit of uncertainty, and come from other people. Cooperation, competition, romance, empathetic joy, feeling good because someone else feels good, all are things 
that feel good come from other people and have this bit of mystery, this bit of uncertainty around what might happen next. Of course, the best example online is social media, right? When you think about when you open up your Facebook newsfeed, you're never quite sure what you're going to see, right? What videos did people post or photos or what does the comments say? How many likes does something get? High degree of variability when it comes to using a social media product. Next is rewards of the hunt. Rewards of the hunt have to do with our primal need for food and other material possessions. And in modern society, we buy these things with money, right? So when you think about um, slot machines, for example, right? When I play a slot machine, what's fun, exciting, what's interesting about playing a slot machine is the variability, is the uncertainty around what I might win when I play these games of chance. Consider for a moment the feed, right? What is it about the feed that makes it so effective? Think about how everything today on your mobile device seems to have a feed. Take LinkedIn, for example. It was acquired recently by Microsoft. You opened up LinkedIn. It's no longer the company it used to be. LinkedIn is no longer about finding jobs and resumes. That's not what LinkedIn is about. LinkedIn is a content company. So when you open up your, your feed on LinkedIn, and you start scrolling through that feed, you'll see one story that's eh, not that interesting, but the next story might be interesting. And to find more of that interesting content, what do you have to do? What do you have to keep doing? You've got to keep scrolling. And that scrolling and scrolling and scrolling use the exact same psychology as pulling on a slot machine. Searching and searching and never done searching for that next interesting piece of information, the rewards of the hunt. Finally, the third type of variable rewards is rewards of the self. Rewards of the self are things that feel good, that have this element of variability, but don't come from other people and aren't about the search for material or information rewards. These are things that feel good in and of themselves. They're intrinsically pleasurable. The search for mastery, competency, consistency, control. Best example online is gameplay. When you think about Angry Birds or Pokemon Go or the Kardashian game, what makes these experiences, these games so engaging is getting to the next level, the next, com uh, completing, completing the next accomplishment, right? Even if there's no material rewards, you're not really playing with other people, there's something exciting about finishing that next accomplishment. Now, I know we're very serious business people here. None of us play games, right? But I bet if you're anything like me, you play this game of checking email all the time, right? I think email is probably the mother of habit-forming technology. That mechanic of finishing those unread messages, clearing them, uh, finishing your to-do list, or the thing that always gets me is that one notification that I have on my home screen that I have to open to clear it away. These are all examples of variable rewards of the self, searching for mastery, consistency, competency, and control. Now, We've talked about triggers, we've talked about action, we've talked about rewards. There's one more step. There's one more step. And this is probably the most overlooked of the four steps of the hook. The last step of the hook is called the investment phase. The investment phase is where the user puts something into the product in anticipation of a future benefit. It's not about immediate gratification, it's about a future benefit. Investments, the, the purpose of the investment phase is to increase the likelihood of the next pass through the hook. And investments do this in two ways. The first way that investments increase the likelihood of the next pass through the hook is by loading the next trigger, loading the next trigger. So for example, when you use uh, WhatsApp or Slack or any number of other messaging services, when you send that message, there's no immediate reward. You don't get points, you don't get badges, there's no leaderboard, you don't get anything when you send that message. But what you're doing is you are loading the next trigger because you will eventually, if the person replies, you will get an external trigger when you get that reply. And that external trigger prompts you through the hook once again, starts the cycle over again. The second way that investments increase the likelihood of the next pass is by storing value. Now, storing value is a really big deal. Storing value is why I love working in the technology industry as opposed to physical goods. If you think about things made out of atoms, right? They depreciate with wear and tear. Things in the physical world, your clothing, these chairs, everything in the physical world 
loses value with use. Habit-forming products do the opposite. Habit-forming products appreciate with use. They get better and better the more we engage with them. By putting data into a product, by putting content, uh, by uploading content into a product, by accruing uh, followers, and finally through reputation. All of these things make the product better and better to use. They customize the product for us, and they make it harder to leave. Here's the message I want to leave you with. When these habit-forming products get us to invest in them, it doesn't matter if a better product or service comes along. This is a really important point. Why? Because it shatters the myth that the best product wins. That is a lie. The best product, there's no promise that was ever made, there's no 11th commandment that says the best product wins. Silicon Valley graveyards are full of companies that had the best technology. It's not the best product that wins. It's the product that captures the monopoly of the mind. The thing that we turn to first with little or no conscious thought, that's what captures the market. So if you're building a product that requires unprompted engagement, requires people to come back on their own, you have to be able to answer these five fundamental questions of number one, what's the internal trigger? What's the itch that your product is addressing? And does it occur with sufficient frequency? Number two, what's the external trigger that prompts your user to action? What's the simplest behavior the user can do in anticipation of a reward? Is the reward fulfilling and yet leaves the user wanting more? And then finally, what's the bit of work done to increase the likelihood of the next pass through the hook? Now, I know this was a quick talk. I only had about 20 minutes. What I want to do is give you an entire slide presentation with lots and lots of examples. So here's what I'd like you to do. Can everybody hold up their phones for me for a second? Hold your phones up for me. This is for two reasons. Hold up your phones. Hi, hi, hi. Number one, I want to get a picture for my Instagram page of you. Yeah, of you. <laughs> this is a great crowd. Two, I just made the action. Remember the action fade? I've just made that behavior easier to do. The phone's in your hand. All you have to do is to go to this URL, www.opinion2.us. Very short survey. Take you 30 seconds. Just five questions. Would love to know what you thought of the presentation. If you have any feedback, I'm constantly tweaking it based on your, uh, your feedback. As soon as you click Submit, you will be taken to a link to my SlideShare page where you can have a much more detailed explanation of all the concepts I just discussed. Now, reminder, at uh, 10 o'clock, I'm going to be doing a Q&A. would love to start addressing some of your questions. And with that, I hope you will use these habits for good. Thank you very much.